Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 280th New Social Environment. I'm Jess Chen, events assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Carrie Moyer and Malva Kajali. We're also thrilled to have the poet Samita Sinha here, who will read to close today's program. We start all of our events with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in Brooklyn, we are on the unceded land and waters of Lenape Hoking, which still belongs to the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second acknowledgement is that Black Lives Matter. We recognize the legacy of settler colonialism as a part of the many contemporary expressions of white supremacy. We honor those that have lost their lives to this violence. I encourage you all to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions as we do our part in the learning and unlearning required to undo this legacy of injustice. And now to introduce today's guest and host. An artist known for her sumptuous paintings on canvas, Carrie Moyer is recognized as one of the most distinctive, powerful, and thoughtful painters of her generation. Moyer's work explores and extends the legacy of American abstraction while paying homage to many of its seminal female figures, including Georgia O'Keeffe, Helen Frankenthaler, and Elizabeth Murray. Her exhibition at DC Moore Gallery titled Analog Time is on view through May 1st. She is joined by our very own wonderful Malva Kajali, a writer living between New York and Chicago. She is the special projects assistant at the Brooklyn Rail and a regular contributor to the South Side Weekly, where she focuses on local culture and community history. Malvika, take it away. Oh my goodness, thank you, Jess. Um, Carrie, welcome. I'm so excited to have you. How are you doing? How's your day been? I'm I'm great. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Crystal. Okay, excellent. I'm uh, just coming off of teaching my class this morning, so I'm uh, uh, trying to settle into some other more contemplative zone. So you're, you're of like being with you, Malvika and Jess. Thank you both. Of Feel course. very honored to be here. We're so excited to be here with you in the Zoom space. Um, I just wanted to go into the title right away, right? You, you named your exhibition Analog Time. Uh, here we are together in Zoom time, in the Zoom <laughs> space. Uh, you know, for those who don't know, the very few of you, uh, Carrie runs uh, the MFA program over at Hunter, and I, I assume you've been sort of in the headspace of Zoom a lot in the last few weeks at the very least. Is that sort of correct? Indeed, I the name for the show was a reflection of the time that I worked on the paintings. I was on leave last semester, so I was mostly um, at the studio and it felt like I was paying so much more attention to being in the moment and that could involve Zoom, but it also involved a, a massive slowing down and thinking about my immediate environment in a way that I don't normally have a chance to do. Will you tell me like a little bit more about um, like how the pandemic changed your relationship to time and environment? Like when you think analog time, when you think slow time, what, is that, what does that mean for you? I think the first thing is that it made me aware of how um, a lot of my thinking and um, making comes from sort of tactile and optical sensations. I think especially as somebody who lives in New York and who's involved in lots of different things, it feels like we're always being um, sort of managed by our calendars and so it, it, to me this word analog might be an analog for something like attention you know what I mean it's like a time to pay attention and not um, um, be constantly thinking about what's the next thing and sort of imagining myself in a space ahead of where I actually am in the moment. Mm -hmm. 
I like that a lot. I feel like one thing that came to mind, and Nick, I think you could even move into the first kind of, uh, I thought of these as very juicy works, but so as we, as we start chatting, you can kind of lay your eyes on those. Um, but one thing I was thinking about as I was walking around in your space, and I, and this really made an impression on me that you were like, no, 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 no. don't tell me what you think. We're not going to talk. We'll talk. <laughs> And as I was walking around, I was like, that's a relationship to time too, right? That we're going to have the conversation when we have it. Um, and what I was thinking about is like analog. It made me think of this um, J.B. Priestley line that comes out of some novel that's like about how clock time is everything. It's your bank manager, your tax collector, your police inspector, your academy. But the inner mm. time is like your wife, right? Or that <laughs> inner time maybe is your studio space. Inner time is maybe... Right. The time you spend in your studio in lockdown. Um, so on that note, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, what does your process look like um, th with these gorgeous works? And you know, if you could sort of talk about like how how do you work in your studio? What is your process? How do you build these up? Mm -hmm. um, the the thing that's different about the show is that I did a lot of work on paper over the summer and um, into the fall and took many of the moves or not not exactly the moves from the paper, but um, some of the processes and effects I was getting on paper, I were, were affecting how I was setting up a painting. Mm -hmm. And those, I mean, I think my painting is always about a kind of material discovery, even if I have an image or a color in my mind. Um, I'm not someone who typically does sketches or preparatory work for paintings, except these sort of small collages. So this, um, maybe Ben could show one of the works on paper. Yeah. This body of works on paper, um, is Nick a whole new you... thing for me. Or Nick, I'm sorry. I called you Ben. I meant Nick. Um, and you can just, just go through them and I'll tell you where to stop. Okay. Just like maybe um, one or two. <laughs> <laughs> so last year I had the fortune, fortunate um, um occasion of being at a residency with my wife, Sheila Pepe, where we worked for a month or more on a suite of works on paper. And it kind of brought me back to the, um, the sense of light that comes from paper. And anyway, I got distracted by the sliding slides, but so, so that, idea of working really immediately, not working for a long time over the image, sort of making something that felt both holistic and a little bit more intuitive mm -hmm. affected this work. I like that a lot. Um, I'm actually wondering, Nick, can you just scroll a little bit forward? There's one that will look like um, mangoes in a wash <laughs> polar ocean. Yeah, this one. Um, and that's my best way I could describe it. But I figure, I, I guess when I think of your larger work, something that doesn't translate in Zoom time is a question of scale, right? To stand in front mm -hmm. of your, your paintings, they're enormous, kind of like Rothko-y. Um, and, and, you know, they kind of wash over you. But this work, for instance, your paperworks are so much smaller. Um, and what I was imagining is like, um, you know, you're quite famous for like the pouring, right? The pouring onto these large canvases. But I was wondering what was the you know, what are the gestures of you making something like this, for instance, you know? So, yeah, these are um, essentially ink and watercolor on very thick 300 pound paper that then get sprayed and washed down. So I'm sort of repeatedly um, uh, soaking the paper with pigment and then washing it off. And some of the effects are done with, I've been putting salt on mm -hmm. on the paper to, to get this kind of interesting texture. I mean, the, the, honestly, 
it's so funny. I got all this stuff in my studio and got ready to make these works. And I was like, there's a whole world of like watercolor painting that I know absolutely nothing about. Um, I think I'll watch some YouTube videos and find out how people you do watercolor because it feels like such a um, delicate process and so easy to um, mangle. Yeah, and, true. you know, so that is one point in my studio where I did step into digital time to assist in the making of these works. Uh, YouTube, as I'm sure everyone knows, is like, you know, where it's at in terms of learning things. Yeah, absolutely. I wonder, Nick, we can go to sort of like, we can browse through the smaller paper ones. Um, but one thing I was thinking about is that these, uh, these smaller paper works, like the one we just saw, they seem a lot more representational to me. Like I know they're, they're still abstraction, but, but I think you described it in your catalog essays, like you're, you're giving us narrative cues on paper. Um, and, you know, David Humphrey, a couple of days ago when you were in conversation with him was like, these works are a lot more verdant, like a lot yeah. more green, a lot more plant life. And I was wondering, uh, how, how do you feel about that? Like, do you think they're, do you see in them a kind of um, like narrative cue? Do you see them in sequence with one, one another? I mean, they are definitely more they have more recognizable forms in them. I think that's how I would parse out the difference. Although that spilled over into the works, the, the paintings too. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, you know, I've, I've had a long time of making this work and putting, depending on which body of work it is, having things that are more or less recognizable as things that we can see in the world, say a leaf or a flower or a bird or, um, and often I've said, well, if you see something in the painting, I it's meant for you to see it. So my, I'm not that interested in an idea of pure abstraction. I don't think I would know what that was anyway. Um, I think I'm always sort of picking up on imagery, both for its purely for its shape or its silhouette and also for its sort of symbolic content. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that was struck me this fall in particular was, you know, both the sense of uh, catastrophe around the climate and then how um, like nature just proceeds without us, you mm -hmm. know? So there's this kind of, um, and maybe I'm sure I'm romanticizing it, but this sort of like both generative and malevolent power on this planet that we occupy that is gonna, um, doesn't care whether we exist or not you know it's like she's reacting to what we're doing to her but she's proceeding nonetheless yeah. um do you so. feel like that, that is like a, a positive or a negative like is that is that something that we can be excited about or is that something kind of malevolent that maybe it'll be <laughs> no because really, i mean i think, I think we're tr yeah yeah well i mean i think that's one of the lessons of the pandemic isn't it it's like um, that we live in this illusion of being in control of our what's going on and we're so not. Um, so I don't know. I, I want to say this is like, I wouldn't even say a backstory, but it's like a kind of worldview that maybe permeates the show mm. um, or how I'm painting right now. I, I don't even know if I'd confine it to the show. Um, but I'm definitely, you know, I think of the painters who have influenced me, especially when I was younger, like, um, you know, Dove or Birchfield, people who believed in this kind of transcendental relationship to nature. Although I'm a city dweller for sure. Um, it feels like it's part of my history. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I also think like 
perhaps there is kind of like the seedy underbelly to the transcendental like relationship of abstraction in nature like like to go back to the previous image i was it makes a lot of sense now that you're explaining this that you know maybe the the thematic as you were working on all of these is like that moment of eco-fascism that moment at the beginning where you know we were all really believing you know the dolphins are returning to the canals the skies are clearing up and <laughs> but, but really truly right? yeah and it's yeah and it's dreamy um but also scary i, I don't know um i guess i, I w was wondering if you could tell tell us a little bit about this work um before i tell you anything before i ask any leading questions like what yeah we this um I think, you know, this work was, again, often, especially with these paper works and even with many of the paintings in the show, what I did was I prepared a bunch of surfaces. So I basically had a lot of paper laid out on the, pa on the table and um, started building up these kind of layered surfaces. So some of the things that you're seeing are like natural tide lines of where the ink dried creating form or suggestive you know spaces and then other parts are me going in there and and tweaking things so you know obviously this form looks very vaginal it also looks like a, a spine perhaps um it and then maybe these kind of nodes and clouds connected to it so i'm really interested in um I mean, I think this runs through most of my work, things that look like suggest body parts, hmm. be they animal or human, and then some kind of morphing or metamorphosis into um, another substance. Hmm. Um, so there's, you know, this idea of symmetry is very central to my work. And it's funny when I was talking with David Humphrey the other day, he brought up the idea of like, um, I don't know if I'm saying it exactly how he said it, but this kind of public facing aspect of the work. So it's very frontal, which goes to, you know, speaks to the way that symmetry is used. And it's, it's not necessarily about something that's, um, secretive it's rather declarative whether you understand what it's declaring or not that's kind of up to you to figure out or make your own assessment of does that make sense yeah i really love that um i also liked that he sort of referred to you as brassy and i i'm <laughs> yeah, i see that in these works like both in the way a person can be brassy and maybe nick could we go to one of the close-up images um they'll look like a uh, very, very close up of the paint, basically. Um, but I like the idea of, you know, them being kind of brassy, both in the sense of like a person being loud, speaking to a public sphere, but also like brassy just in the chemical sense, right? Like if we go to one of the images, perhaps a little earlier, it'll be a, a close up um, of like just the paint and the patina and the way that and perhaps this is more in your canvas work, but there's something about the way that you build up these textures and then they kind of break, like they make mm -hmm. me that, that perfect. Like this, um, this is a great example that you can kind of see, you can see the kind of breaking of it. It almost looks like, you know, and I, I, I see that it's like debris, but it's also, it feels to me like when you have an emulsion break, like when you're making a sauce or something like that, there's yes. this like, very like, like uh, organic kind of mistake you know, almost like something is dripping, uh, you know, down a wall kind of like feeling to it that is really, uh, I don't know, pleasurable to look at, I guess. I, I love that description. Um, I love the idea of the sauce breaking because I think, you know, part of the process of these is um, got to do with the, the ratio of water to polymer, you know, like yeah. these are all acrylic paintings. So once there's too much water in it the whole thing starts to pull apart and that's basically what you're seeing here um so 
and then that sort of dries around these areas that have been exposed. Um, but these are also, um, I'm using sand on the surface too, mm -hmm. to, um, I mean, I hate the word, I, I mean, it's corny, this relationship of like alchemy to studio processes and it's used and overused. Um, but I think sometimes it feels like alchemy to the painter when you're sitting in there and you're experimenting and different things start to happen that you didn't expect. So it's more of a, um, that term becomes a, a statement of the surprise or the delight in finding things out as you're playing around with materials rather than this sort of, you know, it really is being turned into gold. Um, yeah, no, I, I love that so much. And I guess um, while while we're on this image, I want to ask. So for the smaller paperworks, it seems like it's more intuitive. You're not you're never sketching anything out. For the larger mm -hmm. works, um, if you size up the scale so much, how are you working around them? Do you plan out an image, a structure at all, or do you just move intuitively? Like, what is your your process? I've kind of been working in this mode for a really long time. So I'll know, um, you know, what, what, you know, five or six moves I'll do first. And then depending on how they turn out, mm -hmm. then I'll bring in the next layer of information. So I'm always moving back and forth. Often they'll be lying on the table and then they'll go back on the wall um, so a lot of things happen, um, like this part, for example, all sorts of crackleature and stuff happens. I mean, it's incredibly low tech. It's just like fans and time, you know, time to dry and stuff like that. There's nothing fancy really in these paintings, um, except that I'm, have done them for a long time and so I'm good at it. <laughs> reflected like a very particular style of doing it. Right. You said like you know your first five moves. Can you like spell out what those five moves are? Um, Nick, can you show the whole painting of this one? Just one back. Yeah. yeah. So this one, the first move was that white stuff that sort of feels like it's um, a kind of curtain in the back layer. And then that stuff was then glazed over multiple times with different pores. You're just not seeing the... Um, you're not seeing the the tide lines or the where the pores dried. It just was literally poured off the canvas. So it's almost like colorizing something. And and then other things started to happen. Um, this kind of center shape took hold. So I think one of the things that's important um, for my work is how the layer, the layering gets, um, the logic of the layering gets disrupted. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not, um, it doesn't make any sense often. So it's like, what is the space even anyway? What is this picture? What space is this picture describing? It's, you know, the invention and um, a kind of destabilizing relationship to illusion. Hmm. I like that a lot. And that you're sort of, you're inviting interruption or you're inviting kind of complications to happen. Would that be about Yes, that? yes, that, that's a true. <laughs> um, I'm also wondering what does this look like in your studio? I think the last time you were on with Yasi, we talked a little bit about the idea of sort of best working conditions. Um, mm -hmm. you know, do you have any rituals, any 
activities that you do to ground you? Like, for instance, do you listen to particular music or no music? You know? Oh, I listen to, uh, I normally listen to audio books. I'm a huge audio book person. Um, and, you know, all sorts of things. I just listened to The Committed, which was absolutely incredible. Um, Wait, what is and that? It's about, um, uh, it's about the Vietnam War and the aftermath of the war. So often the work, my work doesn't have anything to do with what I'm listening to. Other times I'm listening to super cheesy mysteries. Um, and so, you know, I, definitely partake in the the lowbrow especially when I want to you know you know when you on audible you can find out how long books are yeah if they're more than like 20 hours I want them <laughs> you know what I mean so it's like I kind of writing a narrative as I'm working yeah uh, yeah do you, do you listen to them or do you kind of use them to zone out and just like follow the pacing of whatever you're hearing oh I totally listen to them yeah and yeah. I don't listen to them when I'm not in my studio because I don't want to it's there's something intrinsic about um waiting to find out like who the murderer was it has <laughs> to happen in my studio um Love that. I'm also really into you know like all these like Nordic mysteries uh like Wallander now you're learning my dirty secrets. <laughs> but that, this is actually what I wanted to do. This is like my my dream idea of the conversation is what is everyone's escapist literature? What is everyone's <laughs> literature? Um, and I find this so interesting because you're listening to it, but it's not relating to your work. It's sort of creating this separation. Is it possible? It's like you, you put that on to babysit your brain and then your body makes the painting or do you think you're... Yeah. You know, thinking I love that word babysit because I it's not babysitting my brain it's um it's yeah maybe it is babysitting it's it's um is it the id or the ego which part is it that's going to tell me that I'm doing something wrong I want to quiet that voice yeah. okay so that's the voice that needs to be babysat um the the part of me that just sort of lets me go from move to move and enjoy it and take pleasure in the act of discovery or frustration and then figure something out um, is greatly facilitated by listening to a story like that's you're right my brain is occupied elsewhere um i love that so yeah think of these as like paintings of the id <laughs> even though they don't seem that way but yes maybe yeah i i guess this this makes me think of two questions um and i'm divided on which one to ask one is just about pleasure and one mm -hmm. is about school um but i guess the first one is i i was wondering you know these are very pleasurable paintings to look at especially in person they're just fun like there's a lot and nick you can kind of jump around a little spontaneously. I know I'm being unfair, but um, there are some close-ups of like uh, glitter circles. There are close-ups of just these like immaculate infinite number of dots, and then you'll get a glitter circle that's pink. Um, they're just, you know, they're fun to lay your eyes on. I think they're like fun in an id way. And one of the things I was thinking is like, are you having fun as you're making them? Um, and also like, what what else are you having fun you know, what is pleasurable in the viewing for you, um, you know, right now in your life or, or even just going back to like early art school formative viewing, you know, what what are the things that have like, these are so pleasurable in the viewing and I'm wondering uh, what is pleasurable viewing for you? Oh my God. Um, I don't, I mean, I think, you know, something that I absolutely love doing, which I haven't done much of recently, and I would look forward to it. Um, and this is something I will do with Sheila, 
is going to the Met and not looking at anything contemporary. Um, so it's, I guess it's a way of thinking uh, about sort of the long life of objects, but also, I mean, obvious, you know, you can really take that apart and be really obvious about it, which is like, I don't want to think about the contemporary art world all the time, which involves not only making the work, but the politics of it and all the rest of it. But also the fact that there's been this urge towards making and using visual art as a kind of expression for so long. And just the sheer variety of objects, like I'm really interested in looking at um, instruments and uh, ceramics and all sorts of things. So um, it sort of takes me to this other zone that feeds the work that's not necessarily about responding to what's happening in the moment. I guess that would be a way of saying it. Uh, in general though, I'm just kind of a fanatic about painting. So, um, I don't know. <laughs> That's what I like to look at. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I like the idea of you wandering around the Met, like you and Sheila together. Um, like th this is also my feeling, like the thing to do is to go around the Met and not be thinking about art, but just to be thinking about pleasure. Like if you sneak in like a little chocolate, you know, and just walk around. And, yeah. Yeah, and also thinking about the lives of, um, you know, how these objects sort of sit and in, in, um, interact with us beyond spaces like galleries or museums. Um, one of Sheila's favorite places to go is the Arms and Armor at the Met and look at all the, you know, like amazing metal work and stuff. So I think for me, I'm really interested in like Indian miniatures and um, things that don't necessarily reflect back on my painting, but fill me visually and sort of in terms of thinking about craft and how things got made and imagining people in other times making things. Sorry, I was muted. I think that makes <laughs> sense though. And I love the idea of you, like you and Sheila wandering through the armory, wandering through like the material <laughs> stuff of history. Um, because I, I also, and I guess my question is, do you, do you feel like you do this intentionally, this thing I've not yet said, but I think that there's a lot of stuff of uh, material craft and like commercial craft in, in your work. Like some of your layering ends up having this um, veneer, almost like you've put a vinyl up on the wall and you can speak, you can see like the pock marks that the wall has, you know, or you'll mm -hmm. like the way your work will crack, it kind of cracks like a porcelain or um, I don't know, even here, like there's something about, uh, I really like the way you do these like, you know, these like rich organic spaces and then you'll have uh, kind of like a matte, like a very matte, plain, monotone finish and a, and a design like this, like just a, like this to me think, feels like it functions off of the same brain as, you know, your agitprop and your like poster work, the same design brain, mm -hmm. you know? I don't know, the, how do you feel about this? Like, is this just pleasure making these like little details? No, I mean, it's, I think it's fun, but I also, I think I'm, I'm not just making myself happy. I think one of the things that was very ingrained in, and I was probably the tail end of uh, this generation. So I went to art school in the early eighties, um, but there was much talk in the, 60s and 70s and 50s about a kind of integrated surface. So this idea of having these different tactilities or qualities, um, which suggests a kind of collage space was something that was sort of frowned upon, right? Um, and in my work, 
I think one thing I'm always thinking about, and it's perhaps not so apparent here, but the term brassy um, speaks to it, is issues around taste and what, you know, what does, um, how does taste as this sort of amorphous class related thing operate in painting? So, um, so the notion of bringing in things that are glittery or look like ceramics or suggest different kinds of textures like the the close up you showed before this um i was thinking about like fresco too so i really like the comment about something sticking on a wall like um you know so after all what are these images um there are pockets of space inside, but ultimately they're flat. So there's all sorts of operations going on. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that they're made out of acrylic paint, which is this material that is so much a part of the world that we live in, mm -hmm. in a way that oil paint will never be. Oil paint is devoted, is exclusively for oil painting. Whereas this acrylic material, um, surrounds us so in a funny way the the acrylic in the paintings becomes part of the bigger world in that sense yeah absolutely i love that so much it's like we really are the same way we're in the world of corn syrup we are in the world of acrylic paint it's <laughs> um, corn syrup that's so good yes well i mean but i guess it works for you as well it's like viscous and sweet and drippy um but I guess my, it's my also the it's also like you know, um, uh, well you know it's the how do I say it? It connotes a kind of consumerist um, relationship to the everyday, you know, like plastics and corn syrup. They feel like they go together. Yeah, yeah, I like that a lot. Um, I, I think kind of along the same line, I see in a lot of your material choices, like, um, I hesitate to say this word, but like really a queering or a thumbing of the nose at, at, you know, men, like men doing abstraction, right? Men doing abstraction in closed institutions. Um, and I guess I, I'm wondering, like, do you see it in, in line with that or, or really like, I, I, I mean, I think, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 go ahead. I think the, um, like it's a little subversive, you know, right? I mean, I think maybe when I started doing this, you know, 25 years ago, mm -hmm. um, it was, it felt more subversive. I don't know how subversive it feels at this point. I mean, I feel like we've been blessed with a generation of really incredible women abstract painters who have sort of changed the, the language of abstraction. Um, and so, and that naturally comes from uh, the idea that painting is, is based on this experiential which i i believe it is um so i don't know if it's thumbing if i'm summing my nose at men i'm summing my nose or i was and continue to be because this is the trajectory of the work mm -hmm. at these kind of hegemonic ideas about something like that abstraction can um um, signify a sort of cultural turn or, you know, something that is, uh, is way too granular to be signified by a Franz Klein painting or something like that. I mean, I just resist that sort of totalizing notion. I mean, we don't live in that world anymore, but that was definitely the backdrop of the painting world I grew up in. Yeah. Um, that was the immediate history. That was the um, place you were sort of measuring yourself against. 
-hmm. And I think that's one of the, the reasons for a long time I have been tried to distance myself from the idea of gesture or mark making in that way, because it felt like it was tied to that history. Although that's loosened up a lot in recent years, but um, yeah. That was definitely an impetus in the beginning. I like that a lot. And I, I guess I'm wondering if you're putting forward an idea that is in opposition to gesture and like mark making, what, what would it be? I mean, I think I've set up in my own, you know, little Moyer world vocabulary. It's the, um, the jumping off point is this kind of tension between these sort of flat opaque shapes that are often silhouettes and then the sort of viscous um, core yeah. and, and all the many forms that it takes. So those two moves end up being often in tandem with each other or setting up a kind of t uh, tension and and in a weird way, it's very related to the time I um, sort of came out literally as a painter, not as a lesbian, but as a painter. And how, you know, you can see it in many different women's work from that time. If you think about Deb Cass, how were people reacting to the legacy of abstract expressionism? And, you know, is there a place for somebody like me in that hit grand history of painting? Um, and what would we do with it? Yeah, I really like that. Um, I'm also wondering how does this uh, sort of pour forward into like, you know, yourself as an educator, sort of moving into the space of, you know, MFA pedagogy. Um, how do you feel? Do you feel like you've seen a lot of I don't want to say mimics, but do you feel like you see a lot of students making work that like follows the grain of your work? Or what do you see? How do you see sort of like your influence rippling forward? Oh, I I think I'm um, like a linear sorry. question. I mean, I think there definitely are lineages for sure. Um, I'm not a very good observer of that sort of thing um, because I've under the false impression that I'm actually trying to react to each person's work and not bring my own prejudices to it. But of course that's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, I think that teaching is really different now than it was during my education. Um, I went to grad school at Bard, and so that was really amazing. But as an undergrad, I went to Pratt, and it was very much um, old school. Like, there were certain ways to do things, and there were other ways that you did not do them. Um, and so I'm always reacting to that and wanting not to be prescriptive. Um, but, of course, my own preferences naturally come out. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I feel like I'm also wondering, do you see a kind of a narrative in the works that you've put together? Like when you look at them, do you see a sequence? Do you see a set of relations? Um, or do they feel like just independent, separate pieces? I mean, there's definitely a relationship, but they're also um, I think of them as kind of their own little worlds in each painting. They, you know, this is a conversation I often have with Sheila. I feel like I'm a crazy person making, you know, 20 different things that don't go together. But once I got them to the gallery, they started to talk to each other in an interesting way that um, couldn't happen in the space of my studio just because of the sort of architecture of it. Um, what do you so, mean yeah. sure of it? Go ahead. Well, it's, you know, it's an industrial building. I don't have room to, to try out different sequencing or, you know, use this 
sort of empty cube as a way to um, draw out comparisons or relationships. And, uh, and in a way, when they're in my studio, I'm too close to them anyway to really understand what they are yet. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, not to take a, a kind of sharp left turn, but I feel like we have about sure. maybe 12 minutes left. So I'd love to ask a couple questions. And one is kind of about collaborative relationships. I'm sort of wondering how, how do you and Sheila work? Do you work sort of together, not at all? Or do you, you know, bring your works to one another at the very end? Obviously, the, the work is perhaps quite very different. But I was wondering if you could like tell me like where do you see cross pollination or if maybe you don't at all oh i mean well i see i think maybe you're asking two separate things if mm -hmm. i understand correctly um we started collaborating in very small ways in 2011 um and we would literally make things and then work on them in our own private space and bring it to the other person to work on. So we would be trading objects back and forth. That collaboration, which we've done a few times at different residencies, has evolved into a place where we trust each other more. So we actually um, work on things not at the same time, but discuss how things will happen. And that happened with the show that we're about to have at the Museum of Art and Design, um, which will open in May. It's traveled from Portland, the Portland Museum of Art. Um, but in terms of influence, I think there's no doubt that being in the proximity or in the orbit of one other artist so constantly for 20 years has affected my work greatly. Um, it, you know, for, there are lots of things I could name, like formal things, things that hang off of the top of the canvas, things that look like webbing, um, ideas about space, ideas about things like ceramics. Um, so she's been a huge influence on me in that way. I love that. Um, I think um, I think what I'd love to do, Nick, if this is okay, do you mind skipping a little bit uh, forward to um, yes, that one right there. It's like twenty one or so. Thank you, Nikki. Um, I guess in 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 our last few few moments, I wanted to ask about some, like a move that you do here that is kind of architectural to me. Mm -hmm. This cross hatching or this weaving. Um, I feel like in a lot of your previous work that I was looking through, I, I, I perhaps wasn't seeing like so much direct representational material. And there's something really interesting to me about like the way you created this space, um, this almost like architectural space within the work. And then there is so much interplay, like here at the bottom, I'm seeing a lot of connections um, to, to the, the paper piece that's called bestiary, right? Um, but I was wondering if you could sort of talk about like these collages, there's, you know, what is it in the collage that, that you can get, like, how does the collage operate for you? I mean, I think that, you know, this one to me, if I were just going to sort of talk about it on the fly is, um, on the one, one part of it is that this show that Sheila and I did together called tabernacles for trying times we were thinking about religious architecture and what you know something like an arch or a dome or a tent um so that was in the air a lot secondly we she and i together spent two months in italy two years ago and so i i had never been to italy before and um or I'd only been there a couple times, but not in an extensive way. And so this allowed me to, to sort of experience religious architecture in a really different way. Um, and so it's been 
in my mind, but I don't totally know what to do with it. Um, and one of the things I've, one of the ways I've thought about it is through this idea of openings or um, some sort of overhead structure. I mean, I'm always interested in like a stage, there's a kind of staginess that shows up in the work and has done for a long time or some kind of entry to a place that might seem mysterious. So somehow this arches and um, Clara stories and forms like that felt like they spoke to that idea. I'm not being very precise here, no, Malvika. No, it's <laughs> good. I, and I, I hadn't seen the connection to the idea of like the big tent and the tabern, you know? But now, but now I see it, and and the idea of the big tent is obviously, you know, the relig. Well, maybe you can explain it a bit better than me. But I feel like the idea of the big tent is still all around us in terms of thinking about like political action, solidarity, things like that. I mean, this is something that um, Sheila actually brought to the idea of our show, which is, you know there were things in the 19th century called tent revivals in America where people would come and listen to like an evangelical preacher mm -hmm. and, you know, become saved. But then there's the notion of the big tent in which many people with different beliefs ha figure out a way to get along and talk about having those beliefs without drowning each other out. Um, and I think that was one of the ideas a sort of background ideas for the the show that we did together and you know i don't know that it's a direct relationship i don't know how direct the correlation is in the work whereas something like this image to me felt like it came very directly from spending time in Italy and looking at books and medieval and Renaissance things. Um, and so I have had a, a, some really intense experiences that I think are yet to come out in my work and they're just sort of emerging. I think that uh, makes a lot of sense. And I, I feel like now that you've told it to me, I, I, I see it so much. Um, and I just wanted to say to Bernicle for trying times will, so it's been, it's about to open May 22nd at the Museum of Arts and Design. Um, and maybe, Indeed. Yeah, and maybe just we can drop a, a link in the chat if that's okay. Um, I wanted to end on this image possibly because it, it's one that uh, I've been thinking about a lot. Um, and I think it relates to the what you were just saying about like spaces of spirituality or spaces of transcendence or like religious architecture. Um, because, you know, when I saw this, I was reminded so much of a conversation I was having with Yassi Alipur uh, recently in Sheila's studio. And we were talking about the sort of um, the idea of a mythological bird, like a like a phoenix that is sort of exists across cultures. Right. And that um, in in a kind of like Middle Eastern context, it's like called the sea morgue. It's um, which literally just means like thirty birds, like thirty birds come together and they become this one grand oh wow you know, bird. And the word is literally just thirty, like bird comes together. Yeah. But something about that just feels like the very essence of like collage. I, I was just standing in front of this, just thinking about it, um, on Saturday. That that feels so much like the essence of both uh, a lot of spiritualism a lot of religion is that kind of you know 30 birds come together and we become one body and also the essence of collage right like i i don't know how many pieces you you know of paper you brought together in this but they come together they become one body um mm -hmm. and also the kind of political organizing that that you're you know talking about with the with the show with sheila that's opening um in may but that so much of it has to do with like this idea of like the whole public, we come together as one fellowship and we come together, we become like greater than the sum of our parts. And um, I don't know if that's sort of what you were thinking about with this image, but that's what it made me think of. Um, I'm I delighted. I love hearing, um, I love hearing what, 
how people see things. I think we are, as artists, we get so used to um, sort of hearing ourselves explain what we're doing that mm. we lose, you know, it's so fun to have this fresh take on things. I mean, the thing I was thinking about when I made this was, um, uh, you know, one of the things that's gone through, that's been a kind of obsession for a few years, but really came to the fore during the pandemic and the lockdown was uh, thinking about the middle ages and, you know, so for me, I was thinking of this as a kind of illuminated manuscript. So it's definitely a creature. Um, and I, I might have been reading, um, my name is Red at uh, the time that I made this. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that was about a sort of group of artists and, Again, it was a mystery, amazing book, if anyone hasn't read it, um, um, that takes place in Istanbul. Hmm. And I don't know, there's something about this image. This is the only one that actually had a title of all these works on paper that I did because it just came to me that that's what it looked like. So maybe I was being very literal. Um, like a bestiary? Yeah, yes. You know, looking at these manuscripts where you don't know exactly what the creature is, yeah. it's, you know, it's got a phoenix for a head and a lion for a body and, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Carrie, I love that. I'm glad we ended here then. Um, <laughs> I think, like, without uh, without realizing it before, I feel like now that we're looking at it with this with these glasses on, it also makes me think so much of like uh, Indian Pakistani miniatures. Yes, you know, definitely. Different kind of movement than I f than the movement that exists in your other works, which is more organic. Yes. You know, like yep. this is a direct like this is a you see a movement that makes sense in the world of what's being depicted. Like wh what I'm thinking about. Um, and then perhaps we can open to questions. But what I'm thinking about is like one of my favorite miniatures. Uh, one of my favorite miniatures just shows like three elephants going wild. They're like elephants on parade. They're drunk in the court of Akbar, <laughs> them, like making mischief. Like one's on the one's um, one's on a bridge, and the bridge is breaking. And one is being ridden by a man. He's flipped over, and one is like climbing up the wall of you know um, the red fort. And uh, the whole thing about the the image is that all three all three elephants are like one elephant, right? It's telling you a story through time. Um, I guess you'll get this. You need to send me the JPEG of that, I'll or tell me where to look at it because I want to see this. It sounds amazing. Yeah, I guess that's what this is kind of reminding me of—that there's a kind of movement in it, and then this kind of instrument at the bottom, and and then it's kind of like telling us a story of how it how to read it. Um, I'm not going to tell you otherwise. I'm going to, I'm going to absorb your, your interpretation. I love that. Okay. Um, I'd love to ask you just in closing, is there anything uh, else that you're just itching to talk about that you just, you know, that, that I have? Oh my goodness. No, I mean, I don't know. This is a great conversation. I'm, uh, I, I I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't have anything brilliant to add. Um, I'm just enjoying being in the moment here. I love that. It's a, a real commitment to present tense, like a real commitment. <laughs> um, how about that? Shall we open to questions? All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Malvika. Thank you, Carrie. And I concur with Carrie. I also want a JPEG of that Indian miniature with three drunk elephants. <laughs> um, going on to questions. So our first question comes from Tim McDonald. Tim, you should be able to unmute. Hi, thanks so much for this. This is awesome. Um, 
Carrie, when I first saw these paintings, I've been looking at your paintings for a long time, but um, as they were flipping through the slideshow, what came to mind was like a Tibetan Tonka painting, those kinds of spaces and, and sort of contemplative nature of them and the color as well. But then the smaller works on paper made me think of the tantric works from Rajasthan, those small works on paper that are made by those like anonymous tantricas. And I wonder if you can sort of say anything about that connection that I've made. It's not necessarily, you haven't said anything about that through this talk, but, but uh, it right. makes me think like analog time is contemplative time. You know? I love that. I mean, I feel like you're, thank you for the question. I feel like you're, um, um hitting on or touching on things that have been in my uh, uh wheelhouse for a really 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 long time and maybe not at the forefront of my brain enough so that i would articulate it right now but mm -hmm. definitely tonkas and definitely tantric paintings um the, i'll just bring up the person who was a very big influence on me in that way was the painter Stephen Mueller, um, mm. who knew a lot about Asian art, like an amazing amount. He was an autodidact, I believe, in terms of that, but so knowledgeable. Mm. Um, so my, my knowledge about it doesn't compare, but I respond so intensely to the paintings themselves and and the shapes and this idea that um that there's a there's a kind of shape that could be mysterious enough for us to want to look at it for a long time mm -hmm. like that it becomes this kind of object for contemplation exactly what you're saying right thanks thank you our next question comes from Betsy Hansel. Betsy, you should be able to unmute. Hi, I um, am wondering about when, when you're making the work, do you think about relating to real things that you talked about, like leaves, vaginas, body parts, et cetera? <laughs> Or they just appear in the work. And I'm asking you that because I do um, abstract photography and people are always complaining that they are distracted by trying to think of what they're pictures of. And I see in your work such a complete unity that I don't think anybody would ever think about that. Yeah, I mean, I maybe the um, thank you for your question, Betsy. Um, maybe the thing your viewers are responding to is the fact that you're taking a you're photographing. I guess it's a real thing, right? But yeah. you've abstracted it, right? So, you know, I think people want to identify pictures or images. There's that drive in us. I mean, I have it too, as much as I enjoy abstraction um, and live and think of myself as inhabiting this world of abstraction. I think my, I think one thing I, I kind of indulge, maybe not indulge, but uh, acknowledge in the work is that desire to find the thing you recognize. So in a way I'm kind of like, all right, here it is. Here's a leaf. Now look at the rest of the painting um, that doesn't have a leaf or whatever. Uh, yeah, I I like your question. Um, but I guess part of the thing I'm trying to do is sort of insist that abstraction is not inaccessible, that it's accessible and, you know, uh, that it's not some kind of obscure language that you have to have this elite education to understand. Um, thank you very much for that. I feel like um, sometimes your my upbringing in various kinds of um, um, notions about what art is supposed to be, and I'm older than you are, um, is very 
distracting from being really creative and working with your work and not being um, uh, influenced by all these outside opinions that are always coming in. Right. You have to, uh, you know, get some audio books to get your ego, to babysit your ego, as Malvika said. Maybe that will help. <laughs> Awesome, thank you both. Our next question uh, comes from Sue Danielson. Sue, you should be able to unmute. Hi there, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to hear you talk about your work. Um, I'm a big fan. And I was just thinking um, when you were talking about uh, nature and um, how it's both um, malevolent and romantic, maybe romantic is the word that I put to it, but it made me think about um, wondering how entropy enters into your thought process when you're making. Oh, that's such a great question. Um, I am so interested in that. I think one of the things that I often try to do with um, some of the surfaces and, you know, uh, back to the idea of, um, uh, how, well, I can't remember the words that we use, but this, the surface sort of pulling apart, that image that had the sand in it, is mm -hmm. how to make things that look like they've been sort of eaten away or um, disintegrated or, you know, dissolved and, that, you know, even thinking about something like mulch or um, some kind of crazy burnt umber mixed with, you know, Indian yellow or something, you know, these colors that kind of suggest decay. So I love that. I love that entropy. Very important. I'm curious if I could ask a follow-up question. Um, you were talking about um, how much nature plays an important role in your work and that you live in the city. And I'm wondering how you engage with nature uh, while living in New York or assuming you live in New York. <laughs> yeah, I live in Brooklyn. I mean, I'm, I think I'm, um, I grew up all over the country and I grew up, uh, I usually say mostly or most, the biggest chunk of time took place in Oregon. Um, and so I feel like I have, but at the same time, I always wanted desperately and knew I would move to New York and become an artist and come out as a lesbian. So somehow those things are all entwined to me. Um, but so in a funny way, nature in the work, sort of exists in the abstract. Um, and maybe it's, you know, I don't, I'm not somebody who's like going out hiking or riding my bike or something. So it's not associated with exercise or, you know, uh, but it's more, maybe back to the idea of this, some kind of power that's greater than we are. And, somehow circles around to spirituality or something. And maybe I'm, nature is not exactly the right word for it, um, but it manifests itself in nature. That's great, thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Our next question comes from the Rails very own Nick Bennett. Nick, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Carrie and Malvika, for this wonderful and lovely conversation today. Um, my question may be related to entropy or not, so it's an odd way to introduce it, but um, <laughs> so I'm thinking uh, living in a very specific moment in relation to the environment and environmental crisis um, with so much happening there and rapidly changing. What kind of encounters do you imagine future viewers will have with the sort of natural richness of in your paintings um, and maybe with the, the verdancy of 
of your paintings. Oh, wow. Wait, are you projecting that there won't be any chlorophyll in the future? Possibly, I'm not sure, but, but uh, it's for you to, to take it that way if you would like to. I mean, first of all, can I just say I love Henri Rousseau as a backdrop? You're killing me with your backdrop. It's Thank so you. beautiful. Um, it's got the I, approval. <laughs> I, wow. Even though I think I, um, you know, have that little place in my heart where I hope in a hundred years people are looking at my paintings. Um, and I think that's something that many artists share. Um, I haven't actually predict or thought about like the conditions of the planet. I mean, I think that there are, uh, this is something we were talking in class of today about. It's like, how do does our work relate to the moment we're living in? And then when that historical cycle moves on, do those concerns remain interesting or important. Um, and so I think the part of my work that might stay important, uh, or I'm just riffing on what you said, is the notion of like artificiality, um, which is basically embedded in the materials, right? It's like, this is, um, almost like a symbol for a leaf or, you know, but it's, it's in a funny way, it's got nothing to do with a leaf itself or even the process of growing. It has more to do with the idea of what a leaf is and yet it's made out of plastic. I don't know. I'm trying to answer your question, Nick. I'm doing a very <laughs> poor job. No, no, you're really not. <laughs> that's, that's such an excellent connection. Um, <laughs> of how these things are interrelated and, and it is about that, but it is not about that. Um, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I think one of the things I've sort of been realizing in my, as I be expose myself to different kinds of art and, and not only painting, of course, but all kinds of things like decorative arts and architecture is like, how prevalent the image of this sort of natural world is, you know, and how much it, how much it serves for a kind of sign system for uh, the generative, the pleasurable, the, um, the things that don't have anything to do with the constraints of culture, um, you know, there are so many ideas sort of bundled up in something that is seemingly as benign as, you know, a flower carved into a mantle or, you know what I mean? So that's kind of where I go with your, your question. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. Thank you, Nick. And our next question comes from Catherine Olson. Catherine, uh, you should be able to unmute. Yeah. Um, hi, Carrie. I really enjoyed hi. this talk today. Um, what I'm wondering is some of your paperwork sort of reminded me visually um, of fossils. And I'm sort of curious if you can speak to the idea um, of like preservation, archaeology, discovery, observation in relation to your work. And if like, those thoughts play into the process of your work? Um, yeah, that's my question. Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm definitely um, thinking about bones sometimes. I mean, often when I'm uh, working in the studio, I'm basically using the blade as a kind of drawing tool. So I'm cutting out forms um, and, you know, bones often show up, but I don't know. I think one of the things that I'm 
interested in in terms of setting up sort of textured surfaces and experimentation around different materials, which I talked about earlier, is the fact that um, these kind of abstract expanses of uh, chemical, you know, the chemical results of these experiments are evocative of natural forms or um, things that happen, you know, if something's left out in the sun or, you know, all of these things that we feel like we sort of understand how weather or climate conditions or chemistry operates on a material. Uh, and I think, you know, part of, you know, that might be part of this idea of the mimetic aspect of painting. It's like, I'm not actually interested in doing something that is based on observation or, you know, even, or capturing something that is realistic. But in the other sense, I am creating surfaces or passages that seem to remind people of different things that they recognize. So there's a, there, there's a, there's like an abstract leap in there between the material, the recognition, and the the thing that it seems to be referencing, but we're not quite sure. Very neat. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. That was a really great question. And for our last question, um, it comes from Sheila Pepe. Sheila, you should be able to unmute. <laughs> so um, first I wanna say that um, you might guess that this is an extended family that now includes the um, rail team. Um, and it's so much fun to listen to you to talk um, I just, it's so wonderful. I've heard Carrie say things today that she hasn't said before, so that's always exciting. Um, and this goes to some questions about um, definitely Carrie's process and issues of analog time. Um, but Carrie, can you describe the difference between what you do as a painter who uh, literally, and, and I would say parenthetically, it also has to do with why it appears that you have many different paintings, but they're actually related, right? So how describe your process of finding each painting that's quite different from an artist who's capable of producing many paintings um, in a short period of time and how that relates to the world beyond painting, the world um, that you situate yourself in as an artist and a painter and um, with a political point of view, with a, a set of values that are also political. Wow. That's you, quite a that's I quite know. a setup. Do you do you get the <laughs> gist of the question? I, get, I think I get what you're asking me. Um, I think the first um, thing to say is that I don't. I I have a on occasion I have somebody help me in my studio, but I don't have anyone make my paintings. So all of my paintings are made by me. Um, except sometimes for the gesso, layer of gesso. Um, so often the paintings will take, you know, two or three or four months. Even some of the paintings that are in the show took a year to make. So, I mean, the thing about finding the image, which feels so old fashioned and kind of related to you know, like childhood concepts of painting that I would have, like imagining what a painter did in their studio um, is, is going to the question that Catherine just raised about, 
making a surface in which it evokes a set of relationships in my mind and then you know trying to tease those out by setting up shapes or um, looking to collages or works on paper now that have moves that might speak to um, this set of sort of associations that gets created through material processes. Um, and, and the other thing that's really important to say about the work and one of the reasons that it takes a long time is that I don't, I'm not interested in having the narrative of how the painting gets made be really clear to the viewer. I kind of want the image to show up as if it just kind of like appeared, um, which means that things have to get pushed around spatially, like things need to be brought forward, things need to be buried. And all of that takes a lot of looking and, you know, uh, changing of color very slightly, you know, et cetera. <laughs> and I don't know, the politics of that are that they're like, it's one person making the painting. Uh, it's not a factory. It's not, um, and there's nothing wrong with um, people who work serially and work at a larger scale. It's just not how I do things. I can't really imagine myself doing it. Um, it just feels like each painting sort of comes together. And then when it doesn't come together, nobody else can fix it or solve it. It has to sit in my studio until I sort it out. Yeah. Or it gets trashed, which sometimes happens. And that's good too. So just a little follow up. Um, I know you won't do it, but I just would like to mark that this for me is a political position in that you clearly can see how, I mean, I know that you can clearly can see how this, your process of painting could be, um, fit into other audiences, um, into other platforms, um, into other forms of painting production that would a value of more money, damn you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, a, different, a, a different position with regard to analog versus industrially made versus digitally made works of art, but that the politics are that you don't choose to. Is that right? Yeah, uh, yes, okay. absolutely. I mean, I think in my own life, my entire, uh, you know, those are the paintings I wanna look at, the paintings that are the, product too. Okay, now I'm in the dark. Um, the product of somebody sort of eccentric vision. The exception to that would be when I was a child and I went to see the board murals of Diego Rivera at the Detroit Art Institute. He had many assistants, but the politics and the drawing and the painting on those frescoes is so magnificent. Um, it's overwhelming. I just say painting uh, fresco is a totally different thing. And I'm happy. Yeah. Thank you, Terry. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you both. Sheila, that was the perfect question or set of questions to close. <laughs> and moving to poetry. At the rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. I am thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Samita Sinha, to the stage. Artist and composer Samita Sinha creates multidisciplinary performance works that investigate origins of voice, the quantum entanglement of listening and sounding, how voice emerges from the body and consciousness, and how voice can be claimed and rescued from voicelessness. 
She synthesizes Indian vocal traditions, Hindustani classical and Bengali vowel folk, and embodied energetic practices to create a decolonized bodily multivalent language of vibration and transformation. Samita, take it away.
Wow, that was absolutely stunning. Um, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Samita. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Malvika. And a big thank you, of course, to everyone who tuned in today and for all of your questions. The Rail is celebrating its 20th anniversary as a nonprofit dedicated to providing free and accessible criticism and community events like this one. If you enjoyed today's event, please consider making a donation to Keeping the Rail and our special projects free, relevant, and independent. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a radical poetry reading with Ben Fama, featuring poetry read by Rachel Rabbit White, Mo Romney, Maya Martinez, and Rachel Oyster Kim. You can now turn on your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. The media, you're amazing. Awesome. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you, Malika. Yeah, Malika. Thank you, Carrie. Oh, so beautiful. Thank Malika. you all. Thank you. That was Fantastic. awesome. Can't wait to see the show. Congratulations, Carrie. Thank you, Malika. Hello. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Hello. Hope to see you in the real world, Catherine. That's Malika, right. Jess, Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. Shamita, I was blown away. That was an amazing performance. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Thank you I so really much. Cry. I cry. What did <laughs> Um, I, I know we're like doing our I think of thank yous, but I just want to say thank you to Jess who did such like an outrageously fantastic job today. Thank you to Nick. Yeah. Um, and thank you to you, Sheila. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, she's just I feel like so wrapped up in all your love. I I just think this is a conversation that's going to keep on going, guys. I told Nick that the, the house expands. <laughs> the family grows. Yeah. Um, nice to meet you, Jess. And, and I mean, I feel like I've seen you guys. Yeah. And Catherine. Um, but I, I, we have to meet in person. We have to go get Japanese food now. Oh, yes. Oh, agreed. Definitely. I'm feeling very um, audacious because I'm two times vaxxed. <laughs> I'll be there soon. You're reincarnated. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Um, we'll see you should soon, we, Sheila. Should we, should we break for lunch? Let's see. Sounds like a plan. Okay. I don't want to, but I guess I'll do it. Um, I love you all. Thank you all for coming. This was really beautiful. Bye. Bye. Ciao.